Today we're going to be learning Masechet Yom Adaf Lamed. The beginning of today's daf is going to sound like a sugi out of Rachel. Um, we had in the Mishnah that Kolam Esech Et Raglav Ta'un Tefillah, anyone who has a bowel movement needs to go to the mikvah. The Kolam Atil Mayim Ta'un Kiddush Adayim Raglav. We're obviously referring to Kohanim, we're doing work in the temple. Anyone who urinates needs to, needs to wash his feet and his hands. So the Gemara is going to say, Bishlama were two lines from the bottom of Kaftadim Ubet, starting really from the word Zakalayabamikdash, which is just a quote from our Mishnah. Bishlama Raglayim Mishum Nitsotso. We understand the legs because of drippings that might come from the urine. The urine might trickle down his leg. And right, we're really referring to men here, which makes sense because we're Kohanim who are working in the temple, is what we're discussing. Ela Yadai, my timer, but why hands? So Amarabi Abba Zotomere Mitzvala Shafshef. So Rashi says, what does it mean, Mitzvah L'Shav Shef? Biyado nitzotzot shomei raglayim and nitazim al raglav. You want to make sure to wipe off any drippings of urine that might be on your body, on your legs. Shelo yitzay bahem chutz, because we're worried that he might walk out. We'll see this in the Gemara in a minute. Maybe we'll actually just fin- not read in Rashi, but read in the Gemara. Misayale l'Rabi Ami. This supports the words of Rabbi Ami, the Amar Rabbi Ami. You have to make sure not to walk out with urine on your legs after going to the bathroom. You might look like you have um, crushed or cut off testicles, in which case your urine is kind of dripping down instead of going out. And therefore, okay, then people will say, oh, your children are mamzerim because people are not allowed to marry someone who's considered a shufcha. The exact details of what who falls into this category, I'm not going to get into, but one can research that. Amarav Papa. So Abim Komo Asur Likot Chiachma. So now we're already discussing the issue of feces, excrement. So in its own place, Asur Likot Chiachma. So what does it mean in its place? Hechidami. Okay, what we mean is on a person's body. So we're going to say here, and what they really mean, Rashi says, b'nekev piyatabat, by basically feces that's in the hole where the feces comes out of. So if it's in its place over there, you're not allowed to say kriyat shema, to which also Rashi says, I think it's Rashi or others say, oh no, it's the Mishnah Brura who says that we're referring not only to, right, lahalacha, we say this is not only kriyat shema, but it's also tefillah, it's also brachot, other prayers, prayers as well. So it's also, sorry, not brachot, it's also learning Torah as an issue. So if the so has been come up, so the kot kliachim, hechidami, what's the case? Idinirate, if it's noticeable somewhere outside, it's noticeable, pshita, then it's obvious. Okay, right, Rashi already told us we're talking about piyatabat, but we don't really know what this means yet. So if it's noticeable, you can see it, then obviously you can't say kriachim, just like you're not allowed to daven. Okay, this happens very often. I've, we've actually discussed this in class with outdoor minyanim. Okay, on my street, there's an outdoor minion. Um, it's almost never meaning anymore, but they still meet sometimes. And there's dogs on the street who, who do their thing anywhere in the street or in the, you know, and there's little areas where they do it. And the davening is right near there. So you have to be concerned that maybe there's stuff on the ground while you're davening. So if it's noticeable, then obviously, idolonirate, if it's not noticeable, and the, what they mean by noticeable is it's already on the outside. Here, it doesn't really mean seen. It means it's on the outside. It's come out a little bit of the body. If it's still kind of on the inside, but kind of right there. So here's a great line. Lo nitzna Torah l'malachei ha'sharei. The Torah wasn't given to angels. And often people have stuff that's ready to come out or, or close to there. So what? Like, how are we supposed to ever dive in, right? The Torah was given to humans. It has to be dealt with on a human level, humans have excrement in their body, waste that needs to come out. So obviously that's not the issue. So what's the issue? The case is if you sit, it will be out kind of considered on the outside, but when you stand, it's more on the inside. That's what we mean by near eight. It's like Mamash right in the middle there, right? We're getting a little bit graphic. And that's the case where it's an issue. And that's why they need to tell you it because it's kind of seen but not seen. This actually reminds us of the sugya of the person who sees but isn't seen, right? A reference to God that he sees but isn't seen versus the blind person who doesn't see but is seen. Anyway, it sounds very similar. Even though it's a totally different topic, it's just the wording reminded me of that. How is this different if he has excrement on his body? 
the Itmar, because that we already know the halacha. So al b'saro oshayu yadav bebeit hakisei rapuna amar. So either if there's so on your on your flesh, or your hands went inside the space where the bathroom is. Okay, some people explain that we're talking about that there's a mechitza. I think it's Rashi who says it. Yeah, mechitza mafseket. There's a mechitza between you and the bathroom, but there's a hole in the mechitza, and you put your hands derech chorsha b'mechitza. Rashi says through the hole, and now your hands are in the bathroom. So Rafun, there's a machloket about both of these cases. So whether you have feces on your body or your hands are inside the bathroom, Rafun Amar Mutar the Kot Kriachma, you can say Kriachma, even though that, that's the case. Rav Chist Amar Asur the Kot Kriachma, right? He says the first opinion is look, your body's outside, or the feces is on your body. We, it has to be a case where it's covered, like you're wearing pants and there's feces on your leg. So if it's covered, it's not a problem, according to Rafuna. Chista says a sore the kot chiyat shema. So there's machloket Rav Chista and Rav Huna. So that must not be what he's referring to. So they say, well, bim koma nafish zuhama, shalom koma lo nafish zuhama. Rav Huna there says you can read chiyat shema because there it's away from its original spot. So it's not as disgusting. It's more disgusting when it's found in its original location. And that's what we're going to say again, if it would be seen when you sit, but not when you stand, then it's going to be forbidden to read Kriyat Shema. Tano Rabbanan, since we're already talking about these kind of topics, they bring some other things. Halacha b'si'uda, these are laws about eating meals. Adam yotze l'ashin mayim, notel yado chat benichnas. If a person goes out to urinate, he has to wash one hand before he comes back in, right? presumably the hand that he used to help him with urinating, and then he could come back in. So he only has to wash that hand. Diber im chavero ve'ikli, but if he stays outside for a while, and talking to a friend, let's say he leaves to go to the bathroom and then he doesn't come back for a while. I'm not even sure if he, it doesn't even matter if he went to the bathroom or not. He walked out of the room for a while and then comes back in. He has to do both his hands. Why? This is a different issue. That was to clean your hands from going to the bathroom. This is because of, um, because you might have had what we call you've already gotten your mind off of your bread and therefore you have to wash again. Here's an interesting halacha. When you do that nitilat yadayim the second time, right? In other words, you've already done it at the beginning of your meal, but now you went out for a long time and you come back, right? The concern here, by the way, is that because you were out for a long time, your hands might have touched something that became impure, that made your hands impure, and then when you come back in, your hands are now impure, and that's why, since you're, you weren't thinking about it while you were having this conversation, you were distracted. We always say yadayim askaniyot. They touch lots of things, and that's why. In the, in the first place, we have to wash the tila yadayim, right? It's remembering the time when they kept Tuma and Tara. Obviously, we don't have to worry about these things nowadays, but we still do it in remembrance. So therefore, we're going to say you have to do it, but when you do it, lo yitomi bachutz v'yikanes. Don't do it outside and then come in. Mipnei chashad, because people will suspect you that you didn't wash your hands again. And you might say, what do we care if people suspect us? What, what's it their business? So let's go on and let's see. So what do you have to do? You go in, you sit down in your spot, and then you wash your hands. And then you pass around and you say, oh, does anyone else need to wash? You take the tapiach, which is the natla, they call it in Hebrew, modern Hebrew, which is the, the utensil you use for washing, and you pass it around, and then you make a big deal to basically show people, oh, look, I just washed my hands. In case they didn't notice you do it, if you start passing around, the tafiyach, everyone will know that you washed your hands. So Amar Rav Chista, Rav Chista says, wait a minute, lo amaran ela lishto. This is only if you came back planning only to drink. Why? Because if you come back planning to drink, you don't really need to wash your hands. You only wash your hands for bread. However, what's the problem? The problem is while you're sitting at the table, you might end up nibbling on something. And then people will look at you and say, hey, wait, you went to the bathroom or you went out to talk to your friend. You got distracted, right? You might have touched something. And now you're touching the food with impure hands. So they'll be suspect. If you come back, but if you come back to eat, no, tell me, people know that you're not going to come back without washing your hands for planning to eat bread. The concern is, and this is classic, right? You come in with the intent to just eat, have a cup of wine. But while you're sitting there, everyone's eating, and then you start nibbling, and then you start touching the food. Now, first of all, it could be that they also really don't want you touching their food if they're concerned that maybe you have impurity on you. Maybe that has something to do with it. But also, they're going to suspect you 
that you weren't intending to eat any more bread, so you probably didn't wash outside, and now all of a sudden you're starting to nibble, and you're now touching the food with impure hands. So again, what's it their business, right? Maybe you'll say, what's it their business? Because you're going to eat food, maybe put it down, and then they're going to end up eating leftovers of it, and they'll end up eating food that's impure. Maybe that's a concern of theirs. In any case, if you plan to come back and eat, everybody knows that, of course, you wash your hands again, and therefore you, there's no issue of this hashad, this suspicion. Me, if I come in, even if it's just a drink, I don't have to wash my hands inside. I can wash them outside because everybody knows that I'm careful about this and they wouldn't suspect me. Right? This becomes then an interesting discussion. Where do you draw the line? Who are people who would be suspicious, who would be suspicious of, and who aren't? It's obviously a little bit dangerous to start drawing lines there because where exactly do you put that line? A new mission. Ain Adam nichnas la Nobody goes into the azara to work unless they're even a tahor person, even if they're pure, until they dunk in the mikvah. Meaning, before they go into the mikvah, everybody needs to go. Uh, before they go into the azara, everybody needs to go into the mikvah. There's a debate: Is this just koanim? Is it just there? La, la, it says la azara la avoda. It sounds like only people who are going to do some sacrificial rite. What if you're not? Some people say maybe this doesn't apply. There's actually a problem with the gear saying, Taviyad Kaufman, which is the earliest version manuscript of the Mishnah. It says, La Azara Villa Avoda, which makes it sound like you always have to go to the mikvah if you go into the Azara, even if you're not going La Avoda, both for the Azara and for Avoda. Of course, according to that, you wouldn't need to say La Avoda. If you're going to the Azara for whatever reason, you'd have to do it, obviously, then La Avoda. So anyway, there's a problem with the, the Nusach. It's not clear what it says. And therefore, there's ramifications. Again, do you have to go even not Lavoda? Some people say the Tosfot Yashanim says you have to go even if you're not planning to do work, because maybe you will. It's very similar to the eating, right? You come back, you plan to drink, but maybe you'll end up eating. So we have to be concerned for that too. So there's all different ways of reading this line. But the point is that for sure, if you're going to do work in the temple, you have to tovo before you go in, even if you know that you're pure. Okay, we started talking about a regular Kohen, and now we're moving to the Kohen Gadol. So the, high, the, the Kohen Gadol, the high priest on Yom Kippurim, what does he need to do? He needs to, we've seen this before, five dunkings in the mikvah and 10 washings of his hands and his feet. Vikulan Bakodesh, okay, he does this all Bakodesh, al Beit HaParva, okay, near the Beit HaParva, if you remember, we saw that in the map. Um, where it is, I will go get it for a second. We have the Beta Parva is right at the south east corner of the Asara. Okay, it's called the chamber, the hides chamber. Okay, if you have the English here, here's in the picture where it is. Okay, that's right on the entrance way into the Asara, all the way on the south side. So we talked about, and you can see it in the picture, there's a little blue. Like there was a mikvah there, okay, on the roof of that building. So that's where he would go. And it was in the Kodesh, it was in the sanctified area. Chutz mizil bilvad, other than one, right? The first time he does it, he doesn't go in the Kodesh, if you remember. He goes on top of the Shah Hamayim in the Lishkap Taftinas, which was right next to where he learned how to do the Ketoret. And there, there was a mikvah, and it was considered still outside the Azara, not part of the inside of the Azara. That one wasn't in the Kodesh because he can't go into the Azara, right? That's this issue. You have a mikvah in the Azara, but you can't go into the Azara until you've gone to the mikvah. So obviously you can't do the mikvah in the Azara as your first dunking. Pursue sadin shabut beno leben ha'am. Okay, now they put up a curtain, another a bit like a sheet, a linen sheet between him and the people. So that he goes into this room, this mikvah, and they put up a little curtain to block him. Okay, mostly as people say, it's for tzniut purposes. So that he has privacy when he goes to the mikvah. Gemara starts off with a brayta. Shaluet ben Zoma. They ask ben Zoma, Tfila zolama. What do you need this Tfila to go into the temple on a regular day? Amar lahen. Umaj mishanemi kodesh the kodesh umi makom shanush kare la makom shanush kare taun Tfila. Well, let's take the kohen gadol on Yom Kippur. It's clear from the Torah. It says it in the Torah that he needs to dunk in the mikvah. Okay, he needs to go. Um, he needs tefillah in the mikvah. Okay, we're going to learn this all on Daf Lamibet. He needs to go between Kodesh to Kodesh, okay? Even if he's in one sanctified area, moves to another. 
Okay, although it's going to be a little bit of a difficulty because we're going to say from a location where he's high of karet to a location where he's high of karet, which seems also kodesh to kodesh, right? If you go into the hechal or the azar or the kodesh kodeshim, right, you're going to be obligated karet. But either it means, some people say it means when he changes his clothing from one type of clothing to another, he changes his clothing. Every time he changes his clothing, he goes to the mikvah, the kohen gadol and yom kippur. He changes back and forth because he does some of the regular work on that day and he does some of the work that's specific to the high priest. And in between, he changes his clothes. When it's specific work for the high priest in Yom Kippur, he wears the white clothing that we've discussed. Otherwise, when he does the regular work on the day, like the Korban Tamid, for example, he wears the Kohen Gadol, regular clothing. So he's you know, the fancier clothing. So every time he switches from Kodesh to Kodesh, could be he switches his clothing. He needs to dunk in the mikvah. And from a place that's Anush Karet to a place that's Anush Karet, right? From the Hechal to the Kodesh Kodeshim, or vice versa, he needs to go on the mikvah. What about from Chol to Kodesh, from the Hechal to outside the Hechal, to the Azara? What about there, right? So there, he's also, right? That's, he's not Anush Karet if he's there to me. He doesn't get Karet for that. To a place, Sha'anush Karet. So in all those places, he needs to go to the mikvah. So Ein Odin, Sheta'un Tefillah. So what, I'm sorry, I said it wrong. Hamishaneh, okay, let's go back for a minute. Hamishaneh michol ha-kodesh, umi makom she'en anush karet, lamakom she'anush karet. If you move from chol to kodesh, okay, this is, I'm sorry, now, now we're talking about the regular Kohen who wants to go into the Azara. He's moving from, my mistake, I, met, I messed up before, before we were referring to, let me just double check my, my information, but before we were talking about Chol and Kodesh, I got confused because of the different interpretations of Anush Karet. Anush Karet, we're talking about also, um, I guess, yeah. Okay, but here we're moving from Anush Karet to En Anush Karet. It doesn't say specifically here, but I assume it means from the Hechal to the Kodesh Kodeshim and back and forth, maybe also to the Azara. But if you're coming from really Chol, not the Azara, but if you're coming from outside this, the Beit HaMikdash and you're going into the temple, or like the Azara, or En Anush Karet, so sorry, the Azara is included in all the previous sections. With the Kohen Gadol, he's switching between the Azara and the Hechal and the Kodesh Kodeshim. So, Ein Odin Shetaun Tefillah. So, wouldn't it be obvious that he'd need to go in the mikvah? Okay, for all a regular person who's coming from Chol to Kodesh or not Anush Karet to Anush Karet, where you're going to get Karet if you're now Tame and outside you weren't obligated Karet, of course, is going to need to dunk. If the Kohen Gadol needs to dunk in all these cases, well, obviously, he will need to dunk. So, that's Benzoma's opinion. So Benzoma basically brings, sorry, that complicated a little, but he brings a basically simple kavachom. The Kohen Gadol moves from place to place inside the Azara, different locations in the Azara. He does different activities. Maybe it means also from one job to another. And in between each of the jobs he does, he needs to go to the mikvah. So if that, and even though he's moving between locations that all have the same basic level of sanctity, even if one is a little more or a little less, but basically all sanctified and places where you're gonna be obligated karet for having impurity. And yet he needs to go to the mikvah each time. So of course, someone who's coming from the outside where it's not sanctified at all, of course, he's gonna to need to go to the mikvah. What? That's, that's obvious, okay? And then it's gonna be a halacha from the Torah because the Torah law says, the Torah says that the Kohen Gadol has to go to the mikvah on Yom Kippur, right? It talks about it there. So from there, they're gonna to learn to anybody else who comes into the Azara. Rabbi Yehuda Omer, Srach Tfila or Serech Tfila Hizel. This is just, this is what we call a Jarabana. The rabbis instituted this kind of Tfila. It's not really obligated by law. What's the point of it? Kadeshi is Kortum, Ayishana, Shabiyadovi, Eposh. It's to remind someone in case he forgot that he was Tame and that he came in contact with a dead body or something like that, in case he forgot. This is to remind him so that he remembers before he goes in. He'll remember, oh, wait. I have to go to the mikvah, but wait a minute. I was with a dead person. I didn't have the sprinkling of day three or day seven. Therefore, they make him do that to refresh his memory and remind him, wait, you have to be careful and make sure you're really pure. So by my kamifliya, what's the root of their machlok? So we're going to have a number of options as to what's the root of their machlok. 
first we're going to say we're actually going to have two answers. After the first one, we're going to have raise a question. The second one, we're also going to raise a question, but then we're going to answer the second one. What they're talking about is, is your work desecrated if you come in, if you're a tame, okay? Or actually, if you didn't, forget about if you're tame. Maybe you're tahor, we don't know. But if you didn't go to the mikvah are, and you do the work in the temple without going to the mikvah, right? you don't know that you're tame. If you're tame, it's obviously a problem. But if you don't know and you didn't go to the mikvah, is what you did disqualified? So, leben zoma mechil avodah. It's disqualified because you didn't. It's a Torah law. You didn't do the way you're supposed to. The Rabbi Yehuda lo machil avodah, but according to Rabbi Yehuda, it's just a Dirabban and it's not going to mess up what you did. Ula ben zoma mi machil. Really, you're going to say according to ben zoma, it's it's your work is is no good. Vahatanya kohen gadol shalot taval velo kidesh ben bega lebega uben avodah lavodah v'datok shera. He distinguishes between two situations. Kohen Gadol, who doesn't go to the mikvah and doesn't wash his hands and legs in between all the different clothing, the change of clothing and the, the rituals that he does on that day. If and then he worked in the temple, it's fine. It's not a big deal. But a Kohen Gadol or Kohen Idiot who didn't wash his hands or, or legs in the morning and did avodah, then is avodah is avodah's psula. It's disqualified. Now, what do you see here? Where did he learn out this issue of going in the morning, right? Going every day before you go into the asara? It's learned out from this kavachomer from the kohen gadol. So if it's learned out from a kavachomer from the kohen gadol and the kohen gadol himself is avodah's kshera, then it should be a kavachomer from there to a regular Kohen, if the whole halach of a regular Kohen going into the Azara is learned from there, and that is Kshera, then also it should be Kshera if you did the Avodah without going to the Mikvah. So therefore, it can't be the Benzoma thinks that your work is disqualified. And therefore, we're going to say, it must be the Machlok it is to say, did you do, did you, did you, um, did you not keep a Mitzvah Asi? Did you, okay, did you Take this positive commandment and ignore it, right? You basically overrode a positive commandment. Le benzoma kai ba'ase. According to benzoma, you did, because it's all learned out. If you look at Rashi, he says, since it's learned from Kavachomer of the Kohen Gadol Shover ba'ase kidichti, berachat episaro b'mayim ulevesham. It says he washes himself in water and then gets dressed. So there you see, it's a mitzvah ase to do that. And if we're learning it out from there, then a mitzvah ase for anyone to do it when they go into the asara. And then if you don't do this, it's not that your work is going to be disqualified. It's not. But you didn't do a positive commandment that you were supposed to do. The Rabbi Yehuda, who obviously says this whole thing is Jerabanan, or who says that, then obviously, according to him, lo kai ba'ase. There is no mitzvah ase, and therefore it's not an issue. Now we're going to question. That was first we question, right? We tried to figure out what the root of the machloket is. That's the root of the machloket. Or really, it's not so much what the root is, but where is there going to be a difference between the two opinions? Because if it's anyway, you have to dunk, what's the difference? Whether it's your abundant or right, that's the difference. Did you transgress, like not keep a mitzvah, a say, a positive commandment from the Torah? Umi ilay le rabbi Yehuda haispar. Does he really hold this way that you don't have to go to the mikvah when you go into the, the azara? Baha Tanya, doesn't it say in a brighter, mitzorah tovel va omeh b'shar nikanol? When you're a mitzorah, you have a whole process to undergo. After you become declared a mitzorah, then and then you're cured, you have seven days where there's things you have to do in those seven days. When you're done with the seven days, okay, you know, you wait these seven days, then you go to the mikveh at the end of the seven days. On day number, then you wait for Hare of Shemesh, right? sun sets and you're pure. Then the next day you go to the Azara and you go to the temple and you stand, if you recall, we talked about this before, in the Lishkata Mitzoraim, which is outside. Okay, so here's our map. Lishkana Mitzvahim, leper's chamber is right here. If you notice, there's a there's a bath, a ritual bath there. Okay, right, right by the, the right the wall of the Asara. And if you recall, right, they go to you now. Why is there a mikvah there? So we're going to see. Okay. Hata, now, according to Rabbi Yehuda, it's only the Rabbanan to go into the mikvah before you go to the Asara. So now it says the Hatanya Mitzora Tovel Omei Bishar Nikanu. According to Tanakama, he goes to the mikvah. That's why there's a mikvah right there. And then he stands Bishar Nikanor, and that's where after he goes to the mikvah, then he gets the blood. And the, remember, we take we do this whole procedure with the two birds, 
and the blood, right? One goes free, one gets killed. The blood of the, of the dead one goes into this mixture. We dip in the azov and then we put it on his, his right ear, his right finger and his right toe. And then we do the same with oil. Then it says, so that's what he's supposed to do according to Tanakhama. He doesn't need to go in the mitzvah because he already went the night before. So now they say, ah, oh, wait. According to this, Rabbi Yehuda says he doesn't need tefillah. Okay, now what did we say? According to Rabbi Yehuda, he needs tefillah on a Durabanan level. So um, does it make sense to say, right, according to this, um, so, uh, yeah, so now he basically, according to Rabbi Yehuda in the bright, so what did he say? Everyone needs to go to the mikveh. It's just, it's right. It's just so that we remember in case we, we have some impurity. And according to this, he doesn't need to go to the mikveh before going into the Azara. So how do we explain this? So they say, what do you mean? It's obvious. And that's why the question was a little hard to get because he already went to the mikvah the night before. That's why he doesn't need to go to the mikvah when he goes into the Azarah. If he hadn't gone to the mikvah on day number seven or the day before, if he hadn't gone to the mikvah on day number seven, then he'd need to go to the mikvah. But he went to the mikvah. That's why he doesn't need it. So then the Gemara asks a good question, which is, this happens a lot where they say, yeah, that was a pretty obvious answer. So why did they even ask the question? What was the point of the question? So they say, Okay, so I want you to get clear all our sources. We have source number one, which is this Brita that we had about a machlok at Ben Zoma and Rabbi Yehuda. Is the tefillah going into the Azara on a Doraita level? Is it from Torah law or is it rabbinic? And is it just to remind you? Then we have this Brita about the Mitzora. Tanakama says the Mitzora goes into the mikvah before he goes into the Azara. Rabbi Yudah says he doesn't need to because he already went the night before, right? Presumably, it sounds like the rabbis are saying, even or the day before, the rabbis are saying, even though he did it the day before, he still needs to do it again. So now the Gemara says, well, listen, the reason why we ask this question is really because we have another contradiction between Rabbi Yehuda and Rabbi Yehuda by bringing a third bright. Um, that's what it means. We wanted to raise a question from a different source. What's, why, is, why is it called Lishkata Mitzoraim? It's because Sham HaMitzoraim Tovlim. That's where people who, are, who have lep le leprous people go to the mikvah before on day number eight. So now Rabbi Yehuda says, and here comes the contradiction, Rabbi Yehuda Omer, Lo Mitzoraim Bovadabru Ela Kol Adam. It's not just for the Mitzoraim, it's really for everybody. Now it's strange that he says this. And now we're going to see because, because he just said a minute ago that the Mitzoraim don't need to go to the mikvah. So because he said they don't need to go to the mikvah, why are you saying that not only the Mitzoraim don't care, but also everybody as well? Which means he holds that the Mitzoraim go to the mikvah there. And he just told us that the Mitzoraim don't go to the mikvah there because they already went to the mikvah before, yesterday. So, how do we explain this? So, we're going to have a number of different options. Okay, we're going to get up to five different possibilities to answer this contradiction. So, now they're going to say, Rabbi Yehuda, um, Lokasha, Hadetavil, Hadelotavil. Oh, you just simply say, okay, and by the way, that's why they raised this question in the first place against. Rabbi Yehuda, because they said, what they were really asking was, well, Rabbi Yehuda seems to contradict himself. He's not clear. He says in one place, the Mitzvah doesn't need to go to the Mikvah, in another place, he says the Mitzvah does. So therefore they say, oh, hadetavil, hadelotavil. The case where it's for the, where he says in the third bright, uh, it's for the Mitzvah in to dunk there. That's in the event that they didn't go to the Mikvah on day number seven, they would go to the Mikvah on day number eight in the morning before doing their process because they haven't gone to the Mikvah yet. But if they already went to the mikvah, they don't need to go again on day number eight. They went on day number seven. To which the Gemara asked, that definitely doesn't make sense. Because, idolo tavil harif shemesh bai. We've seen this many times. If he didn't go to the mikvah on day number seven, and he goes to the mikvah on day number eight, whenever he goes to the mikvah, he has to wait for the sun to set in order to be pure, which means he can't do what he's supposed to do on day number eight in the temple because he has to wait for sunset. He's actually impure still. He still has the impurity of the Mitzvah on him. He can't even be in the Ezra Nashim now. So that can't possibly be. So that option number one is out the door. 
Ella, it has to be he went to the mikvah on day number seven. So again, why in one case does he seem to say the mitzvah doesn't need to go to the mikvah? That was bright in number two. And bright in number three is he says the mitzvah does need to go to the mikvah. So one is he kept his mind the whole time since he went to the mikvah on the fact that he went to the mikvah and made sure not to become impure to anything. And the other is he took his mind off of it. Now there's always a concern if you're not thinking about it, and he knows he needs to go to the temple tomorrow and it's not in your mind. Maybe he became impure to a dead person who wasn't paying attention. And how do we know that this is an issue? Um, if he took his mind off of it, he actually needs, if you're not sure, if maybe you became impure because you weren't paying attention, you need to be sprinkled on day number three and day number seven, and you need to wait a whole nother week to be able to do it. So that's why he goes to the mikvah. If, if he's Masich dat, uh, sorry, let's stop. That was a question. First, we think if he gets his mind off of it, then he'll need to go to the mikvah on day number eight. But that doesn't help because the Gemara says if he didn't pay attention and maybe became impure to something, we're worried about a dead person, he'll need three and sevens. We sprinkled. That's not going to help to go to the mikvah again the next day. And how do we know this? He says in the name of Rabbi Yochanan, if you lost track and you're not sure, then you know you weren't paying attention. You actually have to be sprinkled because maybe you're actually impure. So answer number two also doesn't work. Next. Um, it must be he didn't take his mind off of it. Otherwise, he'd need another whole week. We now learn that you need intent, and this comes up in the Quran Chagiga. If you want a tovel in order to go into the temple, you have to have intent that you're toveling in order to go into the temple. And if you don't have that intent, it doesn't work. So if when you toveled on day number seven for your tzara'at, for your leprosy, and you had in mind, I'm going into the temple tomorrow, then it works. And you don't need to tovel again. That's the writer that said you don't need it. But the last writer we saw, writer number three, that says, you need to tovel again. That was in the case where you didn't have in mind that you were going into the temple the next day. And that's what the Lishkan of Mitzvahim is there for, according to Rabbi Yehuda. That answer stays. And so do the next two. Ibai Deim. Alternatively, you could say, Tnei lo imamru ela kol adam. You can change the wording of the Brita. Instead of saying, lo he said, lo mitzoraim bilvadamru. They didn't only say mitzoraim, but even kol adam. And this says, they didn't say Mitzrayim, they said it's only for other people. This isn't for the Mitzrayim. The lepers went already to the mikveh yesterday. They don't need this. Rabbi our last answer. Rabbi Yehuda ledivrehem de Rabbanan Kamalu. Oh, he was speaking according to the rabbis. And what he says is like this. I don't think the Mitzrayim needs tefillah. But But at least admit to me, according to you, that it's not just lo mitzoraim bilvadamru, ela kol adam. That the rabbi said it's for the mitzoraim. And he said, what are you talking about? It's not only for the lepers, it's also for everyone else. I don't think the lepers need this mikvah at all because they went the day before. But you think they need a mikvah? Well, shouldn't you at least agree that it's for everybody and not just the lepers? The rabbanan, now they have a question. What about the rabbis? Mitzora, daish betuma. Uh, not that it's questions. For rabbanan, what do they think? Why do they think it's only for mitzoraim? Because a mitzora daish betuma, kol adam lo daish betuma. Okay, what does this mean? Rashi says, "Otan tuma hu gal adachshav liga betuma, lefichachu bechashash tumot shema achar tefilah naga." Because he was so tame, he was busy touching all sorts of tame things, and he might not pay attention anymore. And that's why he needs a special, especially for them. They specifically need to go to the mikvah there, which seems to imply, by the way, that according to the rabbis of this brayta, that disagree this third brayta. They don't hold that you need to go to the mikvah to go into the azara. They only think mitzvahim need to do it because they are full of tumah. They are just much more tamay than anybody else. Amalei Abayi Rabbi Yosef, name a rabbanan de pliga alei de Rabbi de Rabbi Yehuda ke ben zama sfira alei lehu. So now they're going to say the in brayta number two. Okay, now we're moving to brayta number two. When it said, I'll reread the brayta. Mitzvah tovel ve'omei b'shar nikanor. Right, the mitzvah dunks there. To which Rabbi Yehuda says he doesn't need to dunk because, right, he dunks and then goes to Sharon Yikonor in the Lushkan of Mitzorim. Rabbi Yehuda says he doesn't need to dunk because he already dunked the night before. So now 
He says, Name on Rabbanan, the Pliga Lady Rabbi Yehuda, Kibenzo Masvir Lehu. Bahai de Katani Mitsora, Lodiaha Koho de Rabbi Yehuda. He's saying, Are we to say, and he's going to suggest both options, that these rabbis who say he needs to go to the mikveh, is it because they hold like Benzoma that everybody needs to go to the mikveh and they need to go to the mikveh to Oraita in order to get into the Azara? And they only brought up Mitsora to tell you that Rabbi Yehuda disagrees about a leper and doesn't think that a leper needs mikveh at all? Or, or do we say like before that the Mitzvah is full of Tumah and therefore he's so Tameh that he's more likely and that maybe the Tanakama here thinks like the Tanakama that we explained in the net in Bright to number three that thinks that a leprous person is the only one who needs to go into the Mikvah but a regular person doesn't need to go into the Mikvah before going into the Azara. And then they'll disagree with what Ben Zoma said. So Amalei, Shani Mitzorah, Dedaish Betuma. So Abai asked Rav Yosef this, and Rav Yosef said, in fact, it's really only a Mitzorah, according to Tanakami. Amalei Abai, Rav Yosef, we'll just go on a little bit more today. Tfilah zo chotzeit, so eno chotzeit. According to Rav Yehuda, that he only has to do it, Shrach Tfilah, the whole Tfilah, anyway, anyone going into the Azara is only, now we're back to forget about the Mitzorah, anyone going into the Azara needs Tfilah, remember, according to Rav Yehuda, the Mitzorah doesn't only because he did the Tfilah the day before. But according to this, right, uh, anyone going into the Azara needs tefillah, but only on a rabbinic level. So do the laws of chatzitza apply or not? Chotzitza or eno chotzitza. Amar lei, kol de tikkun, rabbana ke'en de oray to tikkun. When the rabbis instituted things like a mikvah for someone who didn't really need a mikvah by Torah law, but still all the laws of mikvah apply as they do on a de oray to level. So therefore, yes, a chatzitza would be a problem if you have something separated between the person and the mikvah, that would be a problem, right? If they're wearing clothing or something that separates between them and, and the water, that would be a problem and they wouldn't be allowed to go into the asaha. Okay, we'll end here for today. Interesting situations, which, which you know, come to a lot of halakhic ramifications, but who needs to tovel, when they need to tovel, in which situations, and what was that mikvah doing there in the Lishkat HaMitzvah? Okay, with that, have a good day, everyone.